Hi, so today I'm going to discuss Ebola vaccination. The Ebola Zaire virus was first identified in 1976, and preclinical vaccine studies began shortly after. Although Ebola virus disease, or EVD, is rare and occurred only in remote Central Africa, interest in developing a vaccine was strong due to high case fatality, human-to-human -human transmission, and fears the virus could be used as a biological weapon. In late 2013, an outbreak of EVD began in Guinea and spread to neighboring Liberia and Sierra Leone. Over two and a half years, the outbreak resulted in more than 28,000 cases and more than 11,000 deaths. However, clinical vaccine trials didn't begin until September 2014, at which time four candidates met WHO criteria for fast-track clinical assessment. After safety studies in Europe and the USA, clinical trials in highly affected countries began in February 2015. The only study to produce conclusive effectiveness data was Ebola Sasufi. Initiated towards the end of the epidemic in Guinea, Sasufi used a ring vaccination study design which involves the identification and vaccination of contacts of known EVD cases, as well as the probable future contacts of those contacts. This design aimed to obtain rapid effectiveness data while addressing ethical concerns about using placebos during an outbreak. The final conclusion was that RVSV Zibov offers substantial protection against EVD from day 10 after vaccination. This trial design went on to define the further use of the vaccine. In 2017, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization deemed that there was insufficient evidence for preemptive vaccination with a still unlicensed vaccine, but advised that if a new outbreak were to occur, our VSB should be deployed under an expanded access framework via a ring vaccination strategy. A year later, an EVD outbreak was declared in Equator region of DRC. Reactive vaccination of frontline workers and via the ring strategy began fairly rapidly, but still essentially at the end of the epidemic. Therefore, no additional evidence was generated on the effectiveness of the vaccine or on the impact of vaccination on the outbreak. Immediately following the equator epidemic, an outbreak of EVD was declared in Nord Kivu. RVSV vaccination of frontline workers and ring vaccination of contacts and contacts of contacts began a week later. This was the first time that ring vaccination had been used as a control strategy at the onset of an EVD epidemic. During the two-year-long outbreak, over 300,000 doses of RVSV were administered. Despite the eventually massive deployment of the vaccine, this was still the second largest epidemic ever recorded, with nearly 3,500 cases, amongst them 171 healthcare workers. Over, uh, over 2,200 people died, resulting in a case fatality ratio of 66%. So, although ring vaccination may help to reduce the transmission of EVD, it seems far from the perfect strategy. Not only does it rely on the immediate identification of all EVD cases, and the immediate identification and vaccination of all contacts and contacts of contacts. To avoid further infections, the incubation period of EVD must be at least 10 days. But the incubation period, or the time for an exposed person to develop symptoms and become contagious to others, can be as short as two days for EVD. So, even if contacts of contacts are vaccinated on day zero, they may not have had time to develop immunity before their own exposure. In the worst case scenario, they're infected, develop their own symptoms two days later, and infect others. Who, two days later, go on to infect others, and so on. Until 10 days after the initial vaccination, when the outer ring of vaccine recipients have had time to develop immunity, and transmission could theoretically stop. But to achieve that still means correctly anticipating who all those people and the, and the outer ring should be and racing to vaccinate them on time, on day zero. This is easier said than done. There were major logistic and social challenges to implementation of the ring strategy in the Kivu outbreak. Our VSV Zubov requires storage at minus 60 degrees Celsius, and once defrosted, it can't be moved. So to avoid waste, the multi-dose vials would be defrosted and opened only once 20 eligible people were present at a vaccination site. 
that doesn't really facilitate the rapid vaccination of small numbers of people over a wide area. Throughout the outbreak, there were delays to diagnosis of EVD, with nearly half of all cases only identified post-mortem. Contact tracing, on which the ring strategy relies, was slow and grossly ineffective. Public health messaging implied that vaccination post-exposure would prevent development of the disease, provoking confusion and anger when contacts became sick despite being vaccinated. Demand for vaccination was still high, but as few people were eligible, and the number of doses administered to each site was so limited, there were complaints about inequity and allegations of corruption. The Kivu outbreak has also provoked questions about frontline worker vaccination. Although vaccination of health workers clearly reduced infections in that epidemic, the duration of protection of RVSV is unknown and potentially quite short. Outbreaks this year were episodes of resurgence, triggered by human-to-human -human transmission from a survivor of previous outbreaks in DRC and Guinea. As thousands of survivors remain in these regions, there's a high risk of further epidemics, meaning health workers there are at repeated risk of exposure. We don't know if those people that were vaccinated in 2018 and 2019 are still protected today, or whether a booster dose would be necessary or even useful. Studies are ongoing, but no results have been made available, and SAGE has still not updated their guidance. Testing new strategies of vaccination seems urgently necessary to better protect at-risk populations and better control outbreaks. This should, continue, this should include routine preemptive vaccination outside epidemic periods of healthcare workers and other high-risk population groups in areas that have recurrent epidemics or endemic EVD. Sexual partners of male survivors could also be targeted for preventive vaccination, as there are elevated risk of infection. When outbreaks do occur, targeted geographic or population-based reactive vaccination campaigns are likely to be more successful than the ring strategy. These campaigns should continue once the outbreak is over, given the risk of resurgence or of a new introduction from the animal reservoir. We should also return to the initial hypothesis that a range of vaccines with different specificities is necessary. The best use of each vaccine would be determined by factors including the time to onset and likely duration of immunity, the number of doses required and the possibility to boost them, logistic and cold chain requirements, adverse effects, and safety in different population groups. Two Ebola vaccines are now pre-qualified by the World Health Organization. RVSV is effective with a single dose, providing rapid onset of protection, but questions remain about the duration of that protection and whether booster doses would be necessary or useful. Adverse effects are common, and there's insufficient safety data in pregnant women or the immunocompromised. The J&J vaccine has a longer time to onset of protection, as, a two, as it is a two-vaccine regimen, with a second, different vaccine boosting the first. This probably contributes to a longer duration of protection, which makes it potentially more suitable for preventive vaccination. There are fewer adverse effects, and safety has been demonstrated in pregnancy, children, and the immunocompromised. Work continues to respond to ongoing questions about these vaccines and how best to use them, while aiming to offer protection at, at, to at-risk populations. Episant is involved in two ongoing research studies. The Zebovac study in Uganda aims to accumulate additional data on the immunogenicity, safety, and adverse effects of the JMJ vaccine, including in pregnancy. The Tujio Kore study aimed to determine the field efficacy of the JMJ vaccine, but also to document the implementation of a two-dose regimen in this context, as this was a major question uh, about whether it would be useful. 20,000 first doses were administered in Goma from late 2019, while the epidemic was ongoing in North Kivu. Despite the end of that outbreak, which could have reduced demand for Ebola vaccination, and despite disruptions related to the COVID-19 pandemic that delayed the administration of the second dose by five months, there was a remarkable return rate. 75% of people returned for their second dose. So why is Ebola vaccination still an important subject for MSF? EVD is highly deadly. It still remains a rare disease, but as we saw in West Africa and in Eastern DRC, large epidemics do happen, and they disproportionately affect population groups, including health workers, including MSF staff. 
Epidemic resurgence and recurrent epidemics are now documented, so we're likely to see increased mortality in future. But looking on the bright side, we now have the opportunity to prevent EVD via vaccination. Yet, we're still inefficiently racing to control epidemics and not yet really considering how to better protect populations at risk. Even though two vaccines are pre-qualified and we have quite a lot of information about them, they're still being used under clinical trial conditions. And SAGE has still not updated their strategic recommendations. This is partly due to issues with data sharing. SAGE is reluctant to make decisions without conclusive evidence, but data that, can, could, that could contribute towards better understanding has not yet been made available. For example, the data from the Kivu outbreak and the ring vaccination of 300,000 people has not yet been made available to SAGE. Decisions to tend to then be made only in an emergency during major epidemics uh, when there's a need to. So how can we move forward from here? MSF is already engaging with SAGE to push for an update in their recommendations as an emergency. We could also take further opportunities to implement preventive vaccination interventions, aiming to at once protect at-risk populations, including health workers, in regions where anticipate EVD uh, will occur. We should also continue to aim to implement new response strategies during outbreaks, including the complementary use of vaccines and monoclonal antibody treatments. Observing the results of these activities will allow us to adjust our practices, to refine the concept, and to contribute to a real change in the approach to Ebola. Finally, we should adopt a collaborative and transparent approach, committing to share and discuss our experiences with others in a timely manner and encourage others to do the same. Thank you very much to my colleagues in MSF and Epicent, particularly to the people who helped me with the PowerPoint, because I hate PowerPoint. Um, and especially thank you to my Congolese colleagues, uh, partners, Congolese patients, and the Congolese vaccine recipients who helped me understand this subject.